depressed. He always has, you know, infinitely more energy available already to him. So that's not the, that's not the thing at all. Krishna wants us to love him. That's what he wants. And the, the service that we do is simply the medium of exchange of that love. See? You know, like I was always a musician. So the first thing I learned to do, well, not the first thing, but one of the first things was to play music for Krishna, to chant very nicely and, and all like that. You see, so whatever it is that you do or whatever it is that you have or whatever it is that you want to uh, give to others as a, a token of your affection or your love, give that to Krishna. And then Krishna will reciprocate, not because of the stuff that you offer, Huh? He already has enough stuff. <laughs> it's because of the love. So if we love Krishna like that, then Krishna will be very, very interested and he will come to see, oh, who is this devotee who is loving me so much? I want to see them. And he will appear to accept our service. And this is the goal. This is the objective. This is the perfection. This is the, the end of this wonderful path that Nartam Das uh, was talking about in this song. Are there more questions? Uh, oh, Hare Krishna. Question from Tiago. Please accept my humble obeisances. Once is enough. Again. <laughs> again and again. <laughs> How can we develop an intimate relationship with Krishna if we don't know what's that relationship? That's why you have to study nectar of devotion. Huh? It's like, you know, it's like if you're trying to get married to a certain girl, you know, how do you develop love for her? Huh? You see the absurdity of the question? It's like, why would you want to marry her if you didn't already love her? See? It's one of those chicken and egg things. No, love has to develop spontaneously because of the qualities of the beloved. This is all explained in Nectar of Devotion. In fact, we, we went over that uh, about three weeks ago. In this, but before, just before we started going into Krishna's qualities, uh, there was the beginning of the chapter, the beginning of the second wave I think it's the 19th or 20th chapter, uh, discusses how love arises spontaneously upon the perception of the exalted qualities of the beloved. You know, Krishna has so many qualities. I mean, we just went over that with a fine tooth comb, all of Krishna's qualities. So upon perceiving Krishna's exalted qualities, the devotee automatically falls in love. Uh, you can't say, how? Well, just by hearing about Krishna, you know, just by experiencing Krishna through our devotional service and, and uh, his reciprocation to our attempts uh, to please him. Uh, when we actually get to know Krishna by means of our devotional service, then we'll understand all these things. Uh, just right now, you have to know that in your, in your stage, you follow the rules and regulations of devotional service, and that will develop a desire to actually love Krishna. And Krishna says that in the, in the Bhagavad Gita also. That just think of me, keep me always in your heart, love me with all your heart and soul. Uh, and, and that's really what I want. But if you can't do that, then follow the rules and regulations of devotional service given in the scriptures because that will help you develop the desire to love me. You see, and this desire to love Krishna is the sole cause of love of God. Uh, because when Krishna sees that desire, that sincere desire to want to love him, then he grants the result. Only Krishna can give love of Godhead. Only God can bestow love because this means that we get liberation from the material world it also means that we get a certain amount of influence over Krishna himself and Krishna is not going to give 
this uh, ability to influence him to anyone whose motives are anything less than completely pure. I mean, would you? <laughs> you know, realistically? Well, of course, I shouldn't say that because we see people make bad choices and get into, you know, uh, completely messed up relationships all the time. You know, and they should understand when they're getting into the relationship that they're making a choice to give up a certain amount of their power to this other person. And yet that person is not perfect by definition. I mean, they're in the material world, right? So they're not perfect. <laughs> so if we get into a, a close or intimate relationship with someone in this material world, unless they're a devotee and they're on the path to developing uh, spiritual perfection, we're certain to be disappointed because we're turning over a certain amount of our power, a certain amount of our life to a person who is imperfect. It's like, duh, you know? Like, like the dentist says, you know, this is gonna sting a little. We should understand this, this is a fact of life. But when we surrender to Krishna, Krishna's reciprocation is perfect. Uh, Krishna's dealings with his devotees are always perfectly satisfying to those devotees. Even though we may not understand, uh, just like sometimes you see two people in an intimate relationship who know each other really, really well. And sometimes they may be like, it seems like they're fighting with each other or it seems like they're in some kind of a, a disagreement, you know? But actually, they're just like teasing each other and enjoying each other's company. I don't know if it, Southern people do this a lot. Huh? They'll have mock fights. You know, you go, you go down south in Georgia and Alabama and places like that, and people are like, you uglier than a hound dog. <laughs> you know, and the other one says, you're so stupid, you don't, can't remember your own mama's name. You know, and then they go on like this, right? But it's not really fighting. They're not really fighting. They're, they're, it's a kind of affectionate exchange, uh, mock fighting. So this kind of relationships are there also in the spiritual world, except far more sophisticated. Huh? Just like when Krishna and the gopis are going back and forth, like, okay, Krishna, here we are. Oh, okay, well, now you can go back home because you really shouldn't be out here in the woods. And like, Krishna... Come on, you know, get real. You know why we're here. Let's just get down to it, you know? And Krishna is, oh, well, it's really not proper, you know? Where's my halo? <laughs> yeah. You know? and, the, and the gopis are, oh, you just like to torment young girls. Huh? They're like teasing each other back and forth. It seem, may seem like a fight, but actually it's not a fight. It's actually very loving. Huh? And sometimes there's descriptions of Krishna, Radha and Krishna's pastimes where, um, especially with, with Vishaka, Lalita and Vishaka, the two chief gopis in Radha's uh, group, oh man, they can be really tough. They, Krishna, you have to pay your obeisances to Queen Radha right now or we're going to eject you from her kunda. And Krishna is like, oh, okay, okay. There's some, some offense, you know, that he made. You know, so on the one hand, the gopis are completely surrendered to Krishna. And, and Krishna can do anything he wants. Huh? But on the other hand, if he does anything he wants, then there's going to be consequences. <laughs> but this is all within the context of very intense love. Huh? The love is so intense that it's stronger than the anger. It, it can contain that anger of, the, of those loving pastimes. In this material world, if a relationship got to that point, it would probably break up. Uh -huh. But in the spiritual world, there's no such thing as breaking up with Krishna. <laughs> Radha and Krishna are never going to break up. Uh, they're like part of each other. How could they ever break up? So within their relationship, there are often very intense exchanges that are hard for us to understand. You see, this is why Nartam Das says, the only way to understand the pastimes of Radha and Krishna is to study the books of the Goswamis. The Goswamis explain all these things. 
all the intricacies of rasa. These relationships are far, far beyond anything in this material world. Uh, so it requires some special understanding. Otherwise, we'll misunderstand. And if we think that Radha and Krishna's relationships are like relationships in this material world, then this is very offensive. So we don't want our students to make offense. That's why we're studying all these things. Babaji, in which stage of spiritual life should we read the books of the six Goswamis? Bhava. Well, there are some books like Nectar of Devotion you can read at any stage. Uh, uh, but the really advanced stuff, you know, like Ujwala Nilamani and uh, Vidagda Madhava, Lalita Madhava, uh, these should be read in the advanced stage.